Casey West from 104.3 Wild Country. I want to thank you for being here and welcome you to our very first panel discussion highlighting business leaders who are women here in Idaho. And I'm joined by the lovely, beautiful, fantastic Michelle Hart. I do mornings at 107.9 Light FM, and we're really hoping that next year we can get you all together in one room to do this. But we're really happy that you joined us online tonight. We have a fantastic panel lined up. We'd like to start introducing our guests. I'm joined by Linda Swanstrom. You want to tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and what sure. you do? Hi, Michelle. I'm Linda Swanstrom. I'm the Executive Director for the Idaho State Dental Association. I've been the Executive Director there for seven years, and great news, I'm actually retiring in um, July, so pretty exciting to be on the back end of my career journey. But um, I am a vandal, graduated from the University of Idaho, followed that with an MBA at the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. I've had a career in accounting, in um, technology, 21 years with Hewlett Packard, and then the Idaho State Dental Association. So thank you, and I'm excited to be here. We're glad you're here. Our next panelist will be Carrie Westergaard. You want to tell, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I'm a, the executive director of the Boise Convention and Visitors Bureau, and I've been doing that for about six years. Uh, we market, promote, and sell Boise and the metro area as a destination to visitors, all types of visitors, from leisure to business travelers. Um, prior to that, I was in the Sun Valley Ketchum area for about 18 years, also doing tourism promotion. And other than that, I've been in Colorado and New York, um, always in the hospitality industry. It's a huge passion of mine, and, and I'll do it for till I retire, <laughs> which isn't this year. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we have Tressa Blevins. Tressa, tell us a little bit about yourself. Or, I'm so sorry, Tressa McLaughlin. Hi, I'm Tressa McLaughlin, and thank you for asking me to be here. I'm the president and CEO of Solve. In May, I will be there for 31 years. Mm -hmm. I started right after college, about a year out of college. I went to Boise State University, a proud Bronco. So we're talking vandals, <laughs> throw that in there. Um, we actually sell data processing and promotional and apparel products and a lot of commercial printing in the great state of Idaho, as well as nationwide. We have four locations, 19 employees, all Idahoans, and it's a great place to work. So thank you for having me. Awesome. Thanks for being here. And next we have Diane Bevan. How are you? Tell me a little bit about yourself. So thank you so much for having us. What a great opportunity to close out International Women's Day, yeah. Women's Month. Um, I, yes, I'm the executive director for the Idaho Women's Business Center. I also still serve as the CEO for the Idaho Hispanic Foundation. And I serve on several city, state, and national boards. Wow. So on the city level, um, on Meridian Development Corp and Valley Regional Transit and the Idaho Rural Partnership. So I get to be involved in all those big buildings that we see coming up in downtown Meridian. So that's a lot of fun. And then on the statewide, the Idaho uh, Food Bank and National Association of Women Business Centers. Wow, you have a lot of a lot of levels there, a lot of different passions and things that you're and into. I know. <laughs> Absolutely. So, I mean, that had to be quite a journey to get to where you are in all these different facets. So tell me a little bit about that journey. How did you build up to this leadership role you're in now? You know, that's such a great question that I get asked quite a bit because if you were to ask me about six years ago, I would have said I'm an entrepreneur in rural Idaho. I owned a wedding event center and a couple of prom and bridal retail stores and and you know when we moved to the Treasure Valley I just kind of felt really driven to connect with the Meridian Chamber which led to the Idaho Hispanic Chamber of Commerce which led to the Women's Business Center <laughs> which led to all of those things so it's just kind of been a layer upon layer in my career that's just kind of put me in lots of opportunities to create logistics. That's fantastic so yeah. during all of that maneuvering I'm sure there had to be a time or two where you had to pivot so let's say um, you know, life happened, your career was going one way, something happened, and then maybe you had to meet in the middle or you had a pivot happen. Tell me about a hard situation you had to overcome and like that. Well, and I think to piggyback on that too, is when I first accepted the position to be the first CEO of the Hispanic Chamber of mm -hmm. Commerce, they'd been around for 12 years but really never had a full-time CEO. Oh, yeah. And of course that nervousness of I'm not Hispanic, I don't speak Spanish, but I love people, I love business. And so I jumped into that role. And I think the first time I really Pivot, I just wondered, did I make the right decision, was when I walked into the consulate for the first time and realized that I couldn't understand anything in there, and I was the only person speaking English, and I went in my car and had a good cry, Aww. and but then I realized, you know what, you can do this, you just have to love people, and you know, good people aren't 
race specific or cultural mm -hmm. specific. And then after that, it was just so much easier for me to, to walk into the fear and just 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 lead forward. Absolutely. Keep yeah. pushing yourself yeah, forward. For a sure. good cry in the car and then moving forward. I like that. I can understand car. that. I will admit to that. <laughs> it was a very good cry. Another thing that I find fascinating is you've got um, you've got four kids. So you're handling all of this with four. They're grown now, but how did you really when you were coming up and building this career and who you are now, how were you able to do that with the work life balance with four little ones? You know, I love that question because it's easy to look at my resume and say she is a total workaholic. Yeah. Well, I am, but I think that when you when you work really hard in your career, you also are teaching your children how to work really hard. And I've always tried to find opportunities for them to be either beside me or know exactly what I'm doing. So it's not just that mom's going to a commissioner meeting. She's going to, to meet with developers that are going to build big buildings that have apartments and people need places to live. And so, you know, and when, I, when we owned the wedding event center, you know, at one in the morning, t we were all cleaning, but to our kids it was a dance party. <laughs> and so I think that you just have to bring your children along your professional path with you and realize that there doesn't need to be that work-life balance and separation. I think it's more about inclusion Absolutely. and letting them kind of walk that path. I love that, Diane. Yeah, I love that. You. If you've got more questions for Diane, let us know because we'll have some, we'll open it up to questions at the end. Thank you so much. You're I appreciate so awesome. that. All right, Tressa. So we're going to go in a little time machine and go back 25 years. Okay. So you're 20, well, not 25 years, but your 25 year old self, the wisdom and what you know now, what would you want to tell yourself back then? I think that I would tell myself to um, embrace all the opportunities that come your way. Always say yes, mm -hmm. live in the moment, and then don't make yourself smaller to make others feel better. Absolutely. Sometimes I think we, um, as women, always try to make everyone feel better in our groups. And I think we have to also understand that we make people better by leaning in and saying yes and trying new opportunities. So I would tell myself to do as many things as I can. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. And what do you think we need to do, not only here in Idaho, but nationally, in order to help more business leaders become women? You know, more women business leaders mm -hmm. rise up to these business leadership roles. What needs to be done to, to help kind of cater that and boost that up even more than it is now? I think we need more opportunities like this. I have not met these three women before, and I think more opportunities to network work together, trade different ideas, and also um, mentorship roles. I think we talk about that a lot and how much time do we really spend doing that. I think we need to actively get involved and then if we have people, women in business, in our businesses, I think we need to definitely reach out and try to help them, try to see where they want to go in their career path, what they're trying to do, and be really open and flexible to help them. Speaking of mentors, mm -hmm. tell me about a mentor you've had along your journey and your path. I've been really fortunate over the years. I've had a lot of mentors. The one that I think sticks out in my mind was because of our company, we belong to an association. It's a nationwide association. And not many women are in the industry that I'm in at the time. And his name is Bill Prettyman. And he is actually an owner of a manufacturer back in Georgia. And I was fortunate enough to serve on the board of the industry for 13 years. And he also served on the board. And he was one individual that always encouraged me to speak up or he would encourage, to, or encourage me to try different things or challenge me in some of the ideas that I had. And so he was always great about listening and following up and making sure I wasn't just talking, but I was actually doing. So he was great. Still is great, I should say. Mentors are definitely important. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Thank you yeah. so much for being here, too. And again, if you have any questions for Tressa, please let us know because we'll, uh, we'll open it up at the end. Michelle, off to you. <laughs> so, Linda, when you were introducing yourself, there, the, your background when you were going through school, very, very diverse. How did you get into the leadership position you're in now, and what was that journey like to get there? Well, thanks for asking, and uh, it's been an amazing journey over, we won't say how many years, but a really long time. And as I mentioned, I started my life as a CPA. So I graduated with an accounting degree um, and, and I worked in public accounting and private industry for about seven years before I went back and got my MBA. So I was a late bloomer and going back to business school, but that worked really well for me. And 
my MBA was in finance and marketing. And so out of that, I went to work for Hewlett Packard. Mm -hmm. And I was there for 21 years. And I never would have thought when I was studying accounting at the University of Idaho that I would end up, one, in a global role with Hewlett Packard and be there for 21 years doing worldwide business development, product development, sales, um, or going into association management. But I was with HP for 21 years, had a fabulous career, literally traveled all over the world, met wonderful people, and had an opportunity to retire. So I've done this retirement thing before, this time it's for real. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, um, I took the opportunity to to try something new and to just leap. And I didn't really know what I was gonna go into. And from there, I, I went to work for a company in Portland, Oregon, and I commuted every week. Got on the plane Monday morning at 6 a.m., came home Thursday night at 9 p.m. if it was a great week. And, um, and I did that for a year and a half, and, and I just decided that really wasn't the right life for me. And in my time between where I was in Vancouver, Washington, and um, the Dental Association, I was just taking a breather. And an uh, acquaintance of mine was running the Dental Association. She was retiring, and she called me up and said, hey, is this something that you'd be interested in? Well, maybe. Let me find out more about it. I didn't really know what an association was. I didn't realize that there's an association for associations. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> and, um, and here I am, seven years later, having had really the best career that I've ever had. I've learned more. I've gotten to develop a network of people across the country that are really friends and, um, and had just this really different experience. And what I've learned and, and what led me here is really just a base fundamental transferable skills. Um, I rely every day on my accounting degree. I rely every day on my finance and marketing skills. And so just having that basic business background has helped me end up where I am. The other thing, and I relate to what um, I think it was Tressa said, which is say yes, take risk, and, and just show up and leave yourself open. And the one thing I've learned is that where I am, I never would have predicted, and had I tried to chart that journey, I would not have gotten here. So don't try to over control it. Working in all those jobs that you had been in, what was the best piece of business advice that you've ever received? I have received a ton of business advice, and most of it's been really great, but I think the piece that stuck most with me and that I've tried to really emulate through my career is surrounding myself with great people. And not just great people, but different people. And so people that um, have different ideals, different values, different backgrounds, different skill sets, that's really what has been a big difference for me and making me successful because I'm not the smartest person in the room and I don't have every answer. But surrounding myself with people who do and who can complement the skills that I bring to the table makes us all successful. And then sharing that journey with them and bringing them along with me and making sure that whether we're succeeding or failing, we're doing it as a team has really helped. And fundamentally, people want you to be successful. So if you can bring them along in your journey, then you'll all be successful. Now that said, work is not all life. You've got to have a little balance in there right. as well. So <laughs> you, you, you try to though. What is the best piece of life advice you've ever received? Everything in life is a choice. And, and I have to choose. And, and there's, even when I think there's not a choice, there is a choice to be made. And whether I'm actively making a choice or not, I am in fact making a choice. And the other piece that balances that is um, you get what you focus on. And so be really careful and choiceful on what I'm focusing on and try and focus on the positive always because if I'm focusing on the positive, I'm attracting positive and I get positive. If I focus on the negative, guess what happens? And that's really proven to be true in my life. Awesome, well thank you. If you have any questions for Linda or anyone else on the panel, you can also comment in the YouTube channel page and we'll do a little question and answer with your questions a little bit later on in the evening. Carrie, let's do a little time travel. You ready for some time travel? If you could go back to Not talk to your- <laughs> 25, does 25 sound good? Okay. Go back and talk to your 25 year old self knowing what you know today. What would you tell her? You know, that's a great question. Um, I think at my 25 year old self, I was um, similar to what Linda said. I, I think I felt like I had to do it all at that age. And 
I didn't want to admit that I couldn't or I didn't. And so I, I would say now the best thing to do is to know what you're good at because that's where you're going to excel and to surround yourself with those that um, can really complement your efforts. And then also find a great mentor or mentors. Um, and don't be afraid to admit that you don't know something and ask those questions because, um, you know, I've, I've learned so much through the years through a lot of bosses, a lot of um, different mentors. I was, I was fortunate to have some great female leaders um, that really just let me uh, lead and was, they were not micromanagers. And I think I've always worked for smaller organizations, so that's probably been where you, you multitask anyway. Um, but what I've really found now, many years later, <laughs> is that, um, yeah, you just build a great team around you. So you mentioned not being able to do it all. I think a lot of us probably feel like that on a daily basis. How, what obstacles do you face in trying to find a work-life balance, and how do you overcome those? Well, that's the key. <laughs> that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, I'm a single parent, and uh, I, think, I think like many of the other panelists, I, you just uh, involve your children when you can. Now my, now my kids are 14 and 18, and I've been involved in tourism. So it's a fun industry, right? So we have a lot of events, a lot of hours. Um, but you bring them along and I also like to give back to the community in um, boards that I serve on and nonprofits and with those there's events right and so they don't know the difference I don't think between like just like I'm bringing them to an event that's a work event or or it's um, a fun event so and it's a little bit harder these days to drag them along but we volunteer <laughs> um, when we can <laughs> we grab them when we can um, and then I always, you know, you have to take time for yourself. I've been doing this 20 minute thing every day. Um, it's 20 minute, uh, you know, one type of exercise or another. And I'm like, you can always afford 20 minutes. And it's, it changes you. It's like, you know, I cannot believe that I wouldn't do this before. And it's something that I just started during the pandemic and it's been really great. One of those key habits it's you gotta great keep habit. pushing through, yes. right? <laughs> Well, Lynn, the same question for you, because you, you're someone who retired once and then decided, well, maybe I'm not done yet. I want to get back into it. Do you have any advice for achieving a work-life balance and how to manage it all? Uh, don't do what I did. <laughs> <laughs> this, this really wasn't, um, wasn't my strength. And um, one thing that I've learned is that balance is a really personal um, point. And, and what's balanced for me isn't what's balanced for anybody else. And um, and don't let other people define for, for you what your point of balance should be or make you feel guilty if you're spending too much time, not that there is such a thing as too much time with your family or your kids and trading off your career or spending more time than maybe other people think you should on your career and trading off your family. Balance is when you feel good about the choices and, and it took me a long time to get there and to recognize that um, I have to be really clear on why I'm choosing to spend the time that I'm choosing to spend where I'm choosing to spend it, whether that's on my family, on myself, or on my career. And, and the other thing that I've learned the really hard way is I probably have a lot more flexibility than I've let myself believe. And so let go of the guilt and let go of the assumptions. Do what feels right in the moment when it comes to where I'm choosing to spend my time. And that's what's worked for me and gotten me to a place of much greater acceptance on what my work-life balance looks like. And having a killer husband, <laughs> oh my Support gosh. Support system is a yes. must. <laughs> I am so fortunate. My, my husband is a rock star and, and he um, has really enabled me to make the choices that I've made in terms of where I'm spending my time. Well, yeah, you have a sports system like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, so so critical to have somebody like that in your life. Uh, Carrie, you know, we were talking before we got started this evening about how, you know, when you were going to school at some point, you thought you were gonna work for an airline and never got into that. Tell me about a time in your career where it was clear that you were gonna have to make a pivot and what that journey and decision was like. Uh, well, sure, you know what's interesting is I've had three different, I was trying to think about this when this question was asked earlier. I've had three different times in my life where I've done these moves um, and mostly have always landed in hospitality and tourism. And when I moved to Boise 10 years ago, 
I was um, going to go into healthcare. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to do this huge career change, and I came over. Um, Idaho is so great because if you don't know someone, someone else does. And so, so many people were willing to meet with me and have informational interviews. And so, I met with so many people, so many great people here before I even moved to Boise and in the healthcare world. And they all um, kept saying, you know, there's a job at the Boise Metro Chamber of Commerce because <laughs> they'd see my resume and then you get, you know, you kind of get pushed into like what you've always done. And I was like, yeah, 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 I know that, but I, I want to talk to you about healthcare. And so eventually I'm like, give me that job description. I looked at it and it was running their leadership um, programs and their young professional programs. And it was enough of a shift for me at that point in my career that I felt um, like I could still use my skills, my marketing, my PR, my sales, and, and it shift enough. And so I did that and it really led me to my dream job and what I'm passionate about today. So did that for a few years and then moved into the CVB world. But so I, I'd say always be open to um, the possibilities of changing what you're doing. Um, and for me, I, I never got into healthcare, but <laughs> 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 but I love what I'm doing today. Well, I know a lot of the women out there might be having that same idea, like maybe it's time for a change. And I know we have some questions coming in. Nikki, do you have some of the questions from the folks on YouTube? Absolutely. So the first one is for Tressa, and it's, have you ever faced a situation, this would actually be a great one for everyone, but where you weren't given a chance because you were female? Um, where I was not given a chance because I'm a female. Or maybe things were more difficult. Mm. You know, that is a great question and that is a tough one to answer because I never um I never put myself in that box that the reason no was because I was female. Okay. I th always thought well the reason no might be because I didn't have enough information, I wasn't capable, I didn't have the right skill set, I needed to learn more. Mm -hmm. So I always looked at myself as okay, if the answer is no, it's not going to be no pretty soon because I'm going to figure out what I need to do to get going and figure it out. I can't think of a time where I was actually told no just because I was female. I love that. So and regardless of what it was, you were like, yeah. I'm going to overcome it anyway. I'm going to figure it out. Good. There's going to be some way I'm going to get there because if I want that yeah. or I think that's the right fit for me, okay, what do I need to learn and what do I need to do? Love that. And I just didn't try to put myself in that box. Good. Thank you. All right, so this one is for Carrie and Diane. Carrie, we'll start with you. You are both really involved in nonprofits in the community. Why is that important to you? Oh, I love um, being a part of every nonprofit. I, I'm actually, I think, on three different boards that I just, I'm really <laughs> passionate about um, the community. And I want to say that uh, because I'm allowed to do that, I probably even enjoy my job even more because I have that time to do that. I always want to uh, be involved in some way or another. I mean, somewhat they've all, you have connections, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm connected to the Girls on the Run. My daughter was in it when she was young. I'm connected to the Ronald McDonald House because we stayed there when my son was born. And so, you know, they're, they're organizations that I'm really passionate about because I have the history. But I just, I think, I'll, you know, I love donating my time at the food bank. I love doing, I just love that. That fills me. Perfect. That's part of that self-care. It's giving back, but also that self-care. Right. I love that. Right. Diane, what about for you? That's a, that great question, and I resonate a lot with Carrie's answers as well. I think for me, serving on Idaho Food Bank, again, goes back to some food insecurities as a child, yeah. but that's not really why, why I do it. I think that for me, nonprofits give you an opportunity to give your time, talent, and treasure to the recipients that have barriers. So if it's, you know, women in business, they have a lot of barriers, especially in rural areas. Mm -hmm. You know, when you think about the, the Idaho Food Bank, the food insecurities aren't always connected to what you think that they are. Mm -hmm. At any given point, someone can be in that position. And there again, it's another barrier that you're helping. And even with, as funny as this may sound, with Meridian Development Corporation, you know, we look at areas of blight in downtown Meridian and we think, what kind of a barrier are they facing? So I think it kind of goes back to me as my ability to serve my time to help other people overcome some of the barriers that they can't overcome on their own. I love that. So lifting yourself up again by lifting others and that's really what Women in Leadership I think is all about. I love that. 
All right, so I've got another one. This one is for Linda and Tressa. Linda, we'll start with you. You both mentioned learning in, which is a big buzzword for women today. What does that look like? Oh, I'm sorry, leaning in to you. I was like, learning in, leaning in to you. So, uh, so what does that look like to you, leaning in? Oh, gosh, um, that's a great question. And for me, leaning in is just really, again, stepping back, which is the antithesis of leaning in, I guess, but, but really stepping back and understanding that there are opportunities, there are choices. I, um, I am the one who has to make the decision, and I am the one that gets to, to move forward and seize the moment, embrace whatever it's going to bring, and, and just go with it. And, and as I said, by surrounding myself with great people, you've got that support network that can help you lean in and carry that that burden, whatever it looks like. But it's it's just an opportunity. Seize seize the moment. Absolutely. Trust anything to add to that? I don't think I can say it much better than that. I think leaning in is a choice and I think it has to be a conscious choice for us to determine when those opportunities come along, is it something we really want to do? The answer should be yes. And if we're scared, we should do it scared. <laughs> and we should keep going forward. I think there's always that opportunity. And if you need support, then you lean on your teammates, as you said. You lean on your support group. But you have to do it. you got to go for it. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Diane, Tressa, Carrie, Linda, thank you guys all so much for being here. Is there any last parting words that you want, uh, any inspiration or anything that maybe we missed that you want to make sure that the women who are watching um, looking for inspiration, which you've already given plenty of, but I want to make sure we don't miss anything important that maybe you want to make sure you get out. Well, I would love to just say that the theme this year for 2021 for International Women's Month is Choose to Challenge. And I think that all of the women here have mm -hmm. chosen to challenge themselves, challenge their roles, challenge the people around them. And, and I love that theme this year because it also chooses us to challenge to to lean in and to and to step in as women in fearful in fearful places. So I love that that was the theme this month, and and thank you so much for having us. Yes, thank you guys. Anyone else? I would say I think that you've got obviously some really great women uh, in this panel, and don't be afraid to reach out, even if it's on LinkedIn, Facebook, send an email, send a card, if you need information or you just have questions. I think we as women should just reach out to each other and help each other. So I would definitely do that. I love that. Love that. Ladies, thank you so, so much. 100% um, heavy lending. <laughs> <laughs> if you 100%. I thought we were going down yeah. the line. <laughs> No. We have time for a couple more questions. Okay, Perfect. I would just, the group out I, there. So, you know, Linda, obviously working at HP and using your accounting degree as, as often as you do in your career now, how do you think we get more girls interested in STEM careers? Oh, gosh, again, don't follow me. I couldn't get my daughter to go <laughs> to a STEM degree as much as I tried. Um, I think really just exposing at an early age to the opportunities is really critical. I, what triggered for me was a class that I took in high school and and it just worked and so parents make sure that you're you are getting your kids exposed. Um, bring them along to, to anything and everything and just make sure that you know as women you've got incredible power and use it and that doesn't matter what role you're in and there's so much opportunity in STEM so embrace it and go. That's a pretty lame answer but it's the best one I've got. <laughs> Uh, you know, Carrie, moving to Boise, obviously, a lot of people, Boise's growing right now, and they're coming from areas larger than Boise. Did you see any challenges moving to a community that was smaller like Boise? Well, I moved here. It was a bigger community. Okay. Uh, because I moved from, oh, from, a, sorry. from, a, smaller, from a smaller community. I moved from a smaller <laughs> community. Um, so challenges, no. Opportunities, absolutely. I mean, uh, just for growth and for mindset, and um, I've absolutely loved being here in Boise. And I guess the other thing I was gonna add when we were going, I thought we were going that way, sorry. <laughs> I was like, 100%, um, was about the fear. I think it's really important to have that, to have that fear, um, because you're not growing, you know? And I've, I've had those times in my life where I've just been um, complacent or maybe overstayed in a position a little bit too long because it was comfortable. And so get out of your comfort zone and um, feel the fear and you will continue to grow. That's my message for. <laughs> so, 
since you both mentioned, you know, trying to figure out is this the right next step for me and, and being scared, what were some of the things you guys weighed when you were making the decision to take that leap into something that seemed totally out of your comfort zone? For me, it's like, well, what's the worst thing that can happen? And, um, you know, all right, set that aside and, and just go and, and look at the possibilities of, of what can happen. And, um, you know, I guess the other point is coming back to what's the track record? You've been successful. You're not checking those skills at the door. You've got it. And so just trust in yourself and go. And that's, that's what I did is just saying, all right, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to bank on success and I'm going to leap. And I know how far I can fall. And you know what? There's the floor, but I know I'll bounce back up. So go. And that's pretty much what I did. Linda, we get another question for you. What are you looking forward to the most in your retirement? <laughs> <laughs> We're both balanced. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I am, well, I bought a midweek season ski pass. That's how committed I am to this. Um, and, and really getting back and, and reinvesting in um, all those hobbies that I have checked at the door while I've been in my career. And, um, and getting involved in, in a few more civic opportunities and really finding that passion of where I want to give back to the community and my family. Um, I'm blessed that my mother is still alive, but you know, we don't have forever, and so I want to spend more time with her and see my kids. Yeah, I think that's something that last year's taught us is treasure yeah. every moment that you can Absolutely. with family. Nikki, do you have a couple more questions from the audience? I do. So this one is for Diane and Tressa. Diane, we'll start with you. Have you ever had, and we just mentioned facing fear, so perfect timing. Have you ever had to face a fear and overcome it? And what was that and how did you overcome it? Oh, I've had so many. <laughs> <laughs> Where shall we start? But, you know, I think that so many times, and well, I think uh, several have alluded to, if they would have tried to script their life, they never would have uh, described where they've ended up today. And I think for me, it's been, you know, with each one of my professional opportunities have been had those step in the fear moments, whether it's, you know, when I first decided to really um, rally around the Hispanic community in Idaho, I didn't really know anything about the Hispanic community. I had never really had involvement mm -hmm. with, with um, and but it didn't take long to realize, and it was really scary for me at first. Yeah, we talked about crying in the car. I, I know. know. <laughs> And, but you know what? I think that the more you do step into the fear and to step in those really hard spaces and realize that whatever seems really hard today, at some point, you're going to be talking about it in the past tense. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be talking about how you made it through that. And then it becomes the experience that you draw upon on the next time. And I think that the more hard times I have, actually the better I navigate them mm -hmm. because you can kind of go back and go, well, you know, I've been through a lot harder things before, you know. And, and I've so, overcome them then, so I'm going to do this one I'm too. Proof I'm still standing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, for exactly. sure. Trust anything to add for that? Um, I think the two that just popped into my mind, the two biggest ones were the first one was when I decided I wanted to buy the business and really looking at all the things that come along with being a business owner got to get a business license, you got to get funding, you got to go to the bank, you've got to figure out a business plan, mm -hmm. all these different things. And that was, that was a little fearful, but for me it was more exciting and challenging than anything. And I wanted it so bad that and I was like, I'm, I'll put the fear in a box and I'll keep moving. And I think the second one that comes into mind recently was when we decided we needed to build our building. Mm -hmm. I know zero about construction. I don't know HVAC. I don't know electrical. I know none of that. And we knew we needed a building, so we just started um, investing the time and talking to people and researching and doing our homework. And when we actually opened up the building and put our furniture in and we were all sitting in it, it was the greatest feeling. Just so, like she was saying, was you got awesome. through it to the other side yeah. of it. You can be proud we of what you We need to have Tressa come talk to the women at the Women's <laughs> Business Center and tell them that they can do that. You know, we you have a woman can so buy a building and build one. Yes, yeah. we can. Yeah. And I did, and it with, I did it with a business partner who happens to be a woman as well. Right. So Wonderful. we did it. That's yeah. fantastic. Okay, this one's for all. And uh, Lisa, we'll start with you. So what are good resources or role models 
for preteen girls to help positive growth opportunities? Um, I think any of the women sitting here on this panel are amazing resources and role models. Um, mothers in general, I think, are, are fantastic. Uh, I know mine was. Um, and traditional resources, Girl Scouts. Girl Scouts is phenomenal. What the, the ethics and the um, just the uh, values that, that they espouse, I think, are, are really strong and great. And then, um, you know, back to the question of STEM, getting, getting your girls on, on college campuses, walking them around, showing them what they can be, getting them connected with um, different, you know, different careers and people who are in there who are younger. Wonderful. Carrie, what about you? Any, uh, any role model advice for preteens in the area, resources? Um, well, definitely what Linda, Linda said, I mean, all those are, are great. Um, we have Girls on the Run, which I'm on the board of, so it depends on what age um, we're thinking of, but uh, I love that organization. It's, it's great for self-esteem and being able to have tough conversations, and um, it's, you know, I can't say enough about that. Um, Leadership Boise Academy, I would seek that out in the schools. Um, I think that's a great way to get to know the community and to get to know um, and that's that's both female and, and male um, participants. But. Love that. Tressa, what about you? Any any opportunities that pop out at you, especially this one specifically for preteen, but I think probably anyone? I would say I wonder if there is, um, and I don't know this to be true, but there has to be some sort of way that you can get women leaders talking to schools, classrooms, associations, bringing people in to just ask questions like this. I'm sure most women leaders would be happy to donate time, donate support, and show up in a classroom, or Boys and Girls Club might be something, or any of the opportunities you mentioned as well. Absolutely. Diane, anything to add? Well, I have to say, we launched a mentorship pro program um, a mentorship academy actually through the Women's Business Center just a few months ago and just seeing the the impact that just ha like what everyone has talked about having someone to talk to that knows a little bit more than you do mm -hmm. and that safe space to talk about your business and so just recently actually last week I was studying the correlation between um, young girls that drop out of high school and entrepreneurship mm -hmm. because they find themselves in a position where to find a job they have to create a job or to go uh, to basically become a business owner and so one of the things that we I think that we could all do is try to really push to get more entrepreneurial education in our high schools but also the mentorship piece of having some of our business owners work with some of these really young entrepreneurs that are 16 and 17 years old and really helping give them an opportunity to overcome barriers that they don't even know they're gonna face yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they have no idea. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Wow, great suggestions from everyone. That was fantastic. Michelle, you've got a couple more from the yeah. audience. Uh, another question for all of you. As a male, what can I do to help embrace leading alongside women? Question from one of the guys watching tonight. Linda, we'll start with you. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Start over there. <laughs> Diane, you're in the hot seat again. <laughs> uh, no, I love that question because... We get a lot of phone calls at the WBC and said, you know, I'm a male, but I really want to support women. I want to champion women in business. And they can become mentors as well. And I think that they can just realize that we're not trying to, to separate. We're really trying to bridge. And I think that, you know, there are so many wonderful men um, that have done so much for women. And, you know, I, I can't say enough about that is that we, I think that, you can create and bridge the gender gap and the equality gap by getting involved. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's not that we want to be separated. <laughs> can I say that? No, yeah, I think that's great. Yeah. I think we all want the common goal at the end of the day. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, how about you? I, I like your word, not be separated and be a bridge. I think when we're at a table and we're talking about whatever project initiative we have, it shouldn't really matter whether it's male or female. It should matter that we're all working towards a common goal. So I think just treat us the same as you would treat any male colleague, that we're there for the same reason you are. So I really like bridge. That's a great word. Another question for all of you, and Carrie, we'll start with you. How have you best handled conflict in your business life and maybe give an example of how you had to balance it out and work through it? Conflict. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I will say one of the one great piece of advice because uh, I I 
am an emotional person that gets really passionate about what I do. So you have to check that a little bit, right? So what I'll do, and this was from a mentor, um, is I'll shoot off an email, but I won't shoot it off to anyone but my mentor. You know, like I will write through, I will, like what I want to say. And then I have to sit on it. And usually I have to sit on it a good amount of time before, and it never gets sent typically because it, it wasn't the right thing to, to send. Um, so for me, um, you know, I think just taking the emotions out of it and having strategy, um, really trying to be more focused on strategic and, um, and then conflict, conflict resolution is just, um, you know, a lot of listening. I think a lot of times people just want to be heard and, and not, they really don't want you to be <laughs> giving them input at that point in time anyway. A lot of so. times you just need to be a sounding board. Exactly. And Linda, have you dealt with conflict like that before? How, how did you deal with it? Absolutely, and, and I'm, hi, I'm a closet conflict avoider. So um, <laughs> it's a challenge for me, but I think Carrie really nailed the answer. And, and I do the same thing, it's the 24 hour rule. Here's how I wanna respond, write it down, check it at the door, and don't let it out the door. And then come back and look at it. The other thing for me too is recognize that generally speaking, um, it is an emotional thing and people are, are in conflict because they're not being heard. And so how can we step back and, and diffuse and really make sure that everybody's points are being heard and then find the common ground and start from there. And that's been how I've tended to resolve conflict. And Nikki, I saw you get handed another question. Yeah in here so um, this past year has been very interesting for just about everyone and with you guys all having such diverse roles in your jobs and your careers what has COVID taught you not only in your business but personally like everybody had to adjust no matter what industry we were in so what did last year what changes happened and how did you overcome them and really how did you and your business have to adapt to what was going on go ahead well, obviously, our phones rang off the hook. Uh -huh. You know, I, the but you know what we've learned through um, through the pandemic is that there are some amazing women entrepreneurs in some of the smallest spaces, and we were trying so hard to outreach to rural rural Idaho, but it's almost the pandemic that has brought them to the WBC. You know, I mean, some of these little towns I had to look up because I didn't even know where they were in Idaho, and you know that run, they're running bed and breakfast, and they're they're ranchers, and they're you know, running tech shops. And, and I think that that for us was just really an opportunity to realize that that, that has actually been a blessing of the pandemic. It's just our, our outreach has increased in 10 times over. Absolutely, and I think entrepreneurs in general, male, female, anyone, has people were like, okay, well this job isn't working anymore. I need to figure something else out. I love that you have an opportunity to help lift those people up around even the rural places, places yeah, in Idaho. And they're still struggling a yeah. lot. But just that opportunity to have someone to talk to, to kind of walk the path with them has been a blessing. Mm -hmm. How has, Tressa, how has your industry and what you've gone through last year, how's that adjusted because of the pandemic? Um, our industry is pretty diverse because we work with a lot of different verticals and um, different types of businesses. So there's a nice balance there. I think the one of the biggest things that I noticed is I think People really recognize that the relationship with other people is very important. Everything is not transactional, that you really have to have a good relationship and people need each other. All the Zoom calls, the long day conference calls on Zoom just sometimes don't get it done. So just to reach out and talk to people and uh, check in on them, I think that became very important and part of our culture that we will continue going forward. Absolutely, I love that. Mm -hmm. Well. Carrie, we all know that the tourist industry probably took one of the biggest hits. So you probably have some interesting insight. But what? how did your job and how did your business kind of adjust with what was going on? And how are you guys looking forward to things now picking back up? Sure. You know, it, it was been a really interesting year. Someone just called it the other day, the year of weird. And I was like, <laughs> that's a good analogy. That's, awesome. that's a good yeah. word for it. Um, you know, we had such a great first quarter I mean we were probably gonna hit record numbers and then March hit last year and the hospitality industry I mean it is the third largest in Idaho but it was hit nationwide you know obviously and and we're such a big convention meeting business market here that we had to change our whole marketing approach 
to more of the staycation, leisure traveler, drive market. So everything just shifted for us. And, you know, I think the Zooms, the um, just trying to really stay connected and be there for our industry um, was really in the forefront right from the beginning. And so that I would love to continue as well, just um, keeping that connection and communication going. I'm looking forward. Is there some excitement because things yes. are opening up? Yeah. I mean, you guys have got to yeah. be like, yay, we made it. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, this, you know, this whole week, actually, it started the last few weeks. There's a different kind of buzz. Um, more rather than people looking, they're actually booking into the future. We have um, groups coming in 2022. We even have this weekend. You know, things are just opening up more. Um, so I definitely am optimistic. I think that uh, we are, are known, as we know, um, that once people feel comfortable, they're going to be visiting. Oh, so. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of our women opened RV parks during the pandemic because they of all well. the increase in camping. <laughs> Absolutely. They, they, had, well. they already had a property on the river and said, you know, so there's been a lot of pivoting because of, mm -hmm. of the tourist industry. and. and how many of your listeners how far out they go mm -hmm. um, are you in rural communities yeah. at all because some of the you know mountain towns and rural they actually had a boom during all yeah. of this because mm -hmm. people were flooding to those smaller um, places so Idaho being so diverse really saw different differences mm -hmm. depending on where you were Everybody's adjusted, but still, people are ready to get back. <laughs> yeah. uh, Linda, about, what about for you? Dental, I, I, I don't know. Did, was there a lot of change in your industry? Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my industry is the association, right? We're the professional association for, for the dentists of the state of Idaho. But dentistry was crazy. So um, at the CDC's recommendation, dentists predominantly closed their businesses for about six weeks early on in the pandemic because we didn't know about the virus. We didn't really know how it was transmitted. When you think about you're in somebody's mouth yeah, and you know they can't be masked because you're doing work in there and you've got stuff spitting out everywhere. It was a little dicey. Um, and so once we, we really got a handle on what the appropriate PPE was um, and what the protocols really were and, and how the virus was transmitted, then we were able to reopen. Um, and I am pleased to say that there are no documented cases of COVID transmission from a dentist's office. So that is fantastic. Um, they do know what they're doing and dentistry is safe. Let me, let me put in a pitch for the dentist here. Um, if you are afraid to go, don't be, please go because your oral health is absolutely critical to your overall health. And there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong by, by not taking care of it. That said, um, similar to, to tourism and, and everyone else, we were on lockdown and um, and we as an association, we lost a, a third of our revenue stream because we weren't able to have our, our main events. Um, and we had dues and, and, and all kinds of things that we put on hold um, during the pandemic. And um, we are coming back. We had our first in-person meeting in March. It was lovely. <laughs> we had 100 people. Wow. Yes, um, we sold out. We did a hybrid meeting. So, you know, learning the new technologies of in-person and virtual at the same time and how to make it work. It was so phenomenal to have people in the same room. And I got off the plane with the president of the association. I was talking to him for about five minutes, and all of a sudden they went, wow, I'm actually seeing you. I haven't seen you in anything other than a two-dimensional screen for a year. And so it was just so invigorating and, and you can't replace that. So I think your point on reaching out is, is really critical as well. We, we need that connection. It was great that there was the uptick in Zoom calls and keeping connected, but there's something about that human connection you oh, just can't be, yeah. you know? All right, so I've got a fun one, ladies. Um, what do you do? We talked about work-life balance, but what do you do truly for fun? And Carrie, I'm going to start with you. What is something fun that you do, whether it's with your kiddos or just by yourself? Something that kind of gets you through. We know you got your 20-minute workout yep. routine. <laughs> That's not always fun. Though. Okay, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what do you do? It's like a must-do. What do you do for, for that you would consider um, fun on your days off? Gosh, I love being outside on the trails. I love to hike, uh, bike. I mountain bike I will say I'm not one of those hardcore but I do like to do that and ski in the winter and I love spending time with friends and you know even uh, uh, drinking Idaho wine <laughs> like, yeah absolutely what about for you Linda you know 
we're kindred spirits here. <laughs> uh, not mountain biking, but I do like riding out on the green belt um, and just getting out hiking and skiing. Love to ski and um, yes, enjoying time with friends and family. Love a great glass of wine. And you're going to get a little. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And she, you're going to get a lot more of it pretty soon in retirement. That's exciting. Tressa, what do you do for fun? We do a lot of camping. Uh, my husband and I are both um, Idahoans, so we do a lot of camping, a lot in the great outdoors, and we do a lot of barbecuing with family and friends. I'm not of the Idaho wine, but I am of the Idaho beer. <laughs> so we go to the, a lot of the different breweries that are around, and we try the new ones oh, just to fun. see, just to support the local ones. So it's fun. I love that. Mm -hmm. Well, I like both, so I'll go out with either of you. <laughs> All right, Diane, what about for you? You know, for me, it's really kind of goes back to those growing up on a farm roads. I love to can. I love to garden. I love to sew. I'm kind of like little Martha Stewart. <laughs> and, you know, it's interesting. One of my most viral videos is I showed I had made a cornice board. I like to make custom drapes. And oh. so, you know, one time I made, um, you know, an ottoman out of a kitchen table and a baby crib mattress. And so I just like to make things. Of One of these talents. days I will build a house. <laughs> yeah. Or a building. Or a building. Well, there you go. Yeah. yeah, Tressa can sign up. I do remember reading in one of your bios that how you kind of got started in entrepreneurship was sewing prom dresses when I you were in high did. school. I think that's such I a did. fun way to get started. In. And I'm old enough that I also made matching cummerbund and bow ties for the guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's for sure. fantastic. Michelle, what do you got? The Me Too movement, there's a lot of women who are now feeling that courage to speak up and say, okay, this is happening in the workplace and it's not right. How have you guys dealt with discrimination and harassment in the workplace, particularly when it comes to male supervisors or managers minimizing your claims? I'll just let you guys jump in. <laughs> I mean, I, I can say Honestly, I, I've been fortunate. I really haven't had that in my. I've had. I've had before now mostly female bosses, and you know, in small organizations. So either that, or I'm oblivious, and you know, I totally. But I haven't. I haven't. Now I've witnessed it, but I haven't personally experienced that. Let me ask you guys this: as leaders, like, how could you foster an environment where, if a woman is experiencing this in the workplace, that she feel, feels comfortable coming to somebody like you, saying, "Hey, this isn't this isn't okay." Um, I think you have to be vocal about it. I mean, you, I think part of your business culture has to be that that's not tolerated. It, there's just it's a no tolerance policy, and um, in my business, if like you, I haven't really ever experienced that. So it hasn't been too much of a challenge, but if somebody did come and tell me that, it would, we'd, there'd be consequences to that. It's not acceptable. So in a world of smartphones and emails, it seems like the expectation is to work 24-7, 365. You know, I know even in our industry, Nikki and I are probably posting stuff on Christmas. Hey, happy, or Merry Christmas, listeners. Um, how do you create a boundary with that? How do you shut it off? No, we'll start with you. Yeah, and I'm not the poster child for this one. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I do have my time. And, um, and I think recognizing that it's okay to say no. It is, it is okay to say I'm not going to answer my phone at this point in time um, because I do have a personal life and, and you need your personal life. And so just for me, it's give myself the permission to do it and the grace and guess what nobody's ever said what do you mean you didn't answer your phone at nine o'clock at night on a Saturday and they have called at nine o'clock at night on a Saturday <laughs> and and just don't respond until Monday morning but respond early Monday morning and you know acknowledge you got the call and if it's really urgent there are people who they'll text and they'll say I actually really need to talk to you now okay great if they've got your cell phone they know how to text you and let you know it's actually immediate and otherwise just cut yourself that grace and see what happens. You might be surprised. <laughs> Carrie, I know you have your 20 minute workout and anything else you do to make that boundary? Well, I'm not the poster child for that either. But like last week I had a staycation here and probably halfway through the week I worked at different parts of that. You know, I either had to attend a two hour meeting or I, and so finally by Thursday, I just told everyone I'm, I'm not going to be checking in. I'm not checking my email. I'm not checking my phone. And 
I need to have a vacation. <laughs> I need this time. And so, of course, my inbox fills up and then, you know, but it, it all can wait and it all waited. And, you know, I, it can wait till Monday and it did. So the world kept on spinning. It just, <laughs> <laughs> they can resolve, awesome. they can resolve whatever. <laughs> Trisha, how, uh, Trisha, how about you? Uh, like you, I'm not the poster child either, although um, I think the pandemic has forced me to disconnect at certain points in time. When I'm with family or friends or we're doing something, I'm not on my phone. I like hanging out with everybody I know, so I try not to be on the phone, but I also get very stressed when I know that customers may be calling or team members. So I've tried to give myself an allotment of time and saying, okay, it's the evening, I'm done with the phone, I'm done with emails, I'm gonna hang out with my family. So I think for me, it's been more about making a conscious decision to check out and not do that. Diane, how about you? Well, I think it's interesting that all of us have said that we're not the poster child. <laughs> because I think that when you are a leader or a CEO, executive director, whatever your role is, is you know when you have that responsibility of feeling like I'm in charge mm -hmm. is you do feel that whatever that word is that desire that need or that urgency to work a lot and I think that when we started working from home I just realized I had more hours I could work because I wasn't commuting to down my downtown <laughs> office and after a while I realized I've created some really bad habits of working a lot and so you know I've had to be very intentional of turning off and leaving my office and shutting my door but I think too, I mean, I find that like you, you know, I'll get a call or emails and sometimes because if we're in Zooms all day, then we're answering emails sometimes at night. And I've had to train my team that just because I'm their boss, they all feel like, well, if the boss in emails me, I need to email them right back. Yeah. And so I've had to train them that if you get an email from me at nine o'clock at night, I don't expect a response till eight o'clock or nine o'clock the next morning. So I think that we also want to train our our employees to recognize those boundaries and barriers of trying to find that balance but you know when you're in charge that is really hard to do yeah. it is yeah, it's hard oh yeah absolutely because the emails do pile up yeah <laughs> they do pile up yep. and then you yes. think you're not being responsive or you're not helping so. I've used the little um, where you can schedule it so that they'll get it you know I might be writing at 11 o'clock at night but they'll get it at 7 30 in the morning you know sometimes I'll do that little trick. I don't know if it's good or bad, but that's something I've done to get around it. <laughs> but I have to say, yeah. some of our state's biggest leaders do do their emails really late at night because I will tell on him that Director Keeley answered one of my emails at 9 o'clock at night on a Saturday, and I emailed him right back, and all of a sudden we were having this conversation. I said, you know, neither one of us really should be on our computer right, right now. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we're not the only ones that do it, but... Sometimes no. that is the way it is. And you do have to make sacrifices to get where you amazing women are. So thank you guys so much for being here. We appreciate every minute that you've given us and all the information. I know the audience is, like, is thrilled. Jackie's feverishly writing. Okay. There's one more question. One more question. Okay. <laughs> okay. Can I share with you from yes. Back? Okay. If you could create a high school program, what lesson would you teach the next generation of female leaders? So the question is, if you could create a high school program for female leaders, what would it look what like? Would what would you generation? teach the next generation? And Diane, we'll start with you. Well, obviously I'm going to teach them business planning. <laughs> <laughs> because we do have this next year, I mean, even my 15-year-old, I mean, he just wants to be an entrepreneur. But obviously he lives in a house where I'm always coaching business mm -hmm. owners. But I think that we need to really teach more of those business planning skills of how to how to work for yourself because I think it also teaches a lot of leadership opportunities but I think that we need to continually push those programs at the high school level. And teaching independence I think for young women is very important too which all yeah. that follows as well. Wonderful. Yeah. Tressa? I would probably teach in addition to business planning I would teach good communication skills whether that's email, texting, writing or speaking or when we talked earlier crucial conversations. I think communication is really challenging especially if you get in a conflict situation, how can you ask good questions to get past that and work towards a common goal? So communication would be mine. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Carrie? I, I would absolutely say communication as well. Um, public speaking, mm -hmm. I think is really important. I mean, having that kind of age group for kids right now, I know they're on their phones a lot <laughs> and there's not um, a lot of conversations, yeah. deep conversations happening and so, uh, just learning some of those skills I think would be really important. Absolutely. 
Anything to add? I think the only other thing I would add is collaboration. Mm -hmm. and, and really, how do you get a team together? How do you organize? How do you structure? How do you lead in a team environment and, and pull everybody up with you, building off of the core fundamental skills that, that everyone else has said, because they're all critical. You can't do it without it. So we have a whole series of classes, basically. There's a handful <laughs> that are imperative. Wonderful. You guys have brought so much to the table. We appreciate it. I can't wait to do this again, huh, Michelle? Yeah, and hopefully next year we'll get to do it in person. So make sure you stay connected with both Wild Country and 107.9 Light FM on our websites and through our apps. And when this opportunity arises next year and we can hopefully get everyone together in the same room, you guys can come out and ask these great questions in person. Ladies, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. It's been phenomenal. We appreciate it.